Bill, I have a brilliant idea. Why don't we put a little camera to one of those rockets that we've been launching and then take a few pictures? Uh, what kind of pictures, Bob? What, what are you talking about? You know, pictures of those other Kerbals in the Soviet Union that are trying to launch rockets and try to compete with us. We can create a spy satellite, Bill. We can create a spy satellite. Hey, you know, for once, this is actually a pretty good idea. Let's try it. But what should we call it? I don't know, something stupid like keyhole, you know, for when you're peeking through a keyhole and you're looking at people. That sounds pretty awesome, right? Keyhole? You know, sometimes your ideas are brilliant, but sometimes they're really silly. But okay, let's go with keyhole. What, you mean it? All right, let's do it. Welcome to What The Math. Hello YouTube and welcome to episode 9 of Kerbal Space Program and History of Space Flight. In today's video we're going to be talking about the Discoverer mission and specifically the satellites known as Corona. And this was essentially the first attempt to launch the space satellites by the United States to try to spy on the Soviet Union. Now, all of these satellites were launched on top of the Thor rocket, which is what you see here, right here on the bottom. And this was a very successful ICBM rocket that was used for many, many, many different space launches. But this was not just a Thor rocket, this, this was actually a combination of Thor and Aegina. And what Agena refers to is the last stage right here, the second stage. Uh, I'm going to just remove this just so I can show it to you. And this is what it looked like. So basically, the Agena rocket was essentially this part right here. And it was a, it was a pretty powerful rocket by itself. And uh, this rocket right here involved some really, really complex um, schematics in it. First of all, what are these two things right here? Well, these are actually two cameras that actually produced stereoscopic image uh, when captured from the surface of the planet. Now, these were essentially the spy satellites that US tried to launch, and specifically not just US, but CIA tried to launch to spy on the Soviet Union and on the communist China. And uh, all of these satellites, when they were launched, uh, their main purpose was to basically take as many photos as they could. Um, and then, once the photos were complete, they would actually then separate. Uh, well, first of all, they would actually transfer all the film into the capsule right here, and then they would separate. And the last stage right here would use parachutes to return back to Earth and would then be recaptured by uh, either the Navy or some other US Army personnel because a lot of these um, satellites were relatively difficult to recover. And as a matter of fact, the first few satellites were never recovered and are still somewhere out there on our planet. But the Agena rocket itself is actually still even used today because it's, uh, it's evolved so much that um, it is uh, probably one of the more successful US rockets out there and even though it's so tiny, it's actually, uh, its success stems from the fact that it used two propellants in its uh, body right here that did not require any kind of ignition or anything else and so it could actually be started and stopped at any time by simple um, commands from Earth. In other words, it was one of the few rockets to actually have a second stage that was uh, able to be controlled from the surface of the planet by basically uh, issuing a command, like for example, start ignition, and it would start ignition and then stop ignition, it would stop ignition, and then you could actually control this rocket from uh, from Earth by simply uh, sending commands to uh, to its communication module which would then issue the specific command to this rocket so it was a very successful design and it still uh, is a pretty successful design even today so we're gonna try to launch this stage and basically this is what it looks like when you re reassemble it so this is what this rocket looked like. So on the bottom we had our first stage, which was essentially just a Thor liquid engine rocket right here. And this used two um, Vernier engines. Uh, in the game they're called Vernon, but they're actually called, known as Vernier engines to essentially uh, control the ascent. So this didn't have any control panels here. This these were just uh, winglets. 
but the vernier engines were responsible for um, controlling the ascent and uh, there was a rocketdyne engine on the bottom right here which was a relatively powerful engine that was used in those earlier thor icbm rockets and uh, so then this would separate and would release the second stage which was the uh, agena rocket which i just showed you before and this was uh, then used to essentially for two things Firstly, it would use these two cameras to take the picture of Earth or specifically one region on Earth that we were interested in. And then once that was done, it would then flip over, decelerate using the um, th this engine here by basically uh, burning toward the, the retrograde vector of velocity and then re-entering atmosphere using this last stage that would actually keep the all of the film that was um, produced by these two cameras. So all of the uh, film was actually transferred to the upper stage right here. It would then separate and uh, this would return back to Earth. So let's try to see if we can achieve all of that uh, using this rocket and Kerbal Space Program. I'm not sure if it will work, but it's a very complex procedure and we're going to try to see if it works. But also, while we're trying to launch this rocket, let's try to talk a little bit more about the history of Discoverer mission and also the Corona satellites, because it's a pretty important satellite that is kind of the uh, grandfather of the spy satellites that we have today. And the Corona program was actually a series of American satellites that were launched by the CIA to try to create a very successful satellite program. Unfortunately, however, it took quite a while to develop that program and there were quite a lot of failures. As a matter of fact, there were more failures in the Discoverer mission than any other mission in the United States. And its purpose was, of course, to spy on the Soviet Union, but also on the People's Republic of China. So essentially, these satellites were developed so that we could or so that US could actually see the all kinds of military deployments in the Soviet Union and in, in the communist China. Now, another name for this program was KH, and specifically here we're talking about KH1, KH2, KH3, and so on. And KH stands for Keyhole, and that's uh, sort of the play on words where Keyhole refers to spying on someone through a keyhole. And basically, this was one of the first few satellite programs that were whose main purpose was essentially to spy on someone else. The early satellites only had one camera, but the later satellites had two cameras under a certain angle. And this was so that they could capture a sort of a stereoscopic or three-dimensional picture that would then create a more uh, detailed picture of what's happening on the ground. And uh, the actual camera placement was actually really original and um, the picture that you would get was actually quite advanced for, for its age. But it's really the recovery that was really, really cool about uh, this particular program. And so here, the recovery was meant to, to be done either via a uh, fl uh, plane flyby. So essentially, the, the upper stage would be released. Uh, it would release the parachutes and then would be captured by an airplane. Or it would... Uh, land somewhere on earth and specifically possibly in the ocean and then if it wasn't recovered within two days uh, some of the uh, compounds in this inside the capsule would actually dissolve and then the actual capsule would drown so that nobody else could capture it but interestingly the, fir the first few capsules that were actually returned to earth were either lost forever and never found like, like for example there's one capsule that flew over the polar region landed somewhere in Norway and has never been recovered even today and uh, there's another one that actually ended up landing in Venezuela and uh, it, the capsule said something like you know stop secret don't open and obviously the people who found it decided to open it just to see what's inside and uh, the the actual material was never recovered so after these few failures, what US started doing is they actually put a little sign in many languages saying a hey, huge reward for anyone who returns this capsule to back to the United States. And actually that worked because the, the next few capsules that were recovered by someone else were returned to the American agents. But despite the complexity of this particular mission, uh, Discoverer mission or Discoverer satellites actually had tons of problems. Um, the first 13 missions were completely disastrous. Well, actually, Discoverer 2 ended up landing in Norway uh, and was never found, but uh, everything else was pretty much a failure. And the first satellite that was actually recovered was uh, Discoverer 13, and this was on 
um, August 10th of 1960. So this, this was actually a year after the first Discover launch. And this was the first recovery of a man-made object from space. And it actually ended up beating the Soviet uh, recovery as well. But uh, the early satellites didn't even have a camera. The first camera was actually on Discover 14. And this camera operated properly and it was then recovered from the ocean about one and a half days after the launch. So about half a day before it actually sank. And it, interestingly, despite the failures, this uh, particular program just kept advancing it. Uh, the satellites were uh, being made even more complex. They had more and more cameras. They received uh, a lot more modules that would improve their functionality. And uh, even though they kept failing, US would just not give up. They kept producing more and more satellites using the Thor rockets. And they essentially just launched them over and over. So all in all, there were actually so many of these satellites launched. Um, between 59 and 60, or 1959 and 1960, there were at least 10 different satellites and at least one recovery of a satellite. Uh, in the next year, 60 to 61, there were seven uh, launches and four recoveries. And as the years progressed, uh, there were more launches and even more recoveries. As a matter of fact, between 1963 and 1969, uh, United States launched uh, 52 different satellites uh, with keyhole designation, and there were 94 recoveries in total. So that's uh, that's actually quite a lot of recoveries. In, in other words, they were able to recover quite a lot of data uh, that was captured from basically sp spying on other countries. And although initially this mission was not classified, after 1963, it became top secret. So nobody could actually uh, know anything about this mission anymore because, well, it became successful at that point and the US started to launch these spy satellites that were able to retrieve quite a lot of data from other countries. And really we knew nothing about this program until uh, something like 1992 when uh, all of these missions were declassified. So um, this was quite a classified information, mostly because uh, not only was it uh, a failure for the first few years, but then when it became successful, it was actually really successful at recovering quite a lot of various data. And all in all, in three and a half years of Discoverer program, uh, this was a relatively interesting program because it was quite a failure for the most part. Uh, most of these satellites actually failed. They either got destroyed in the early stages or they couldn't really even take off or basically they, they exploded on launch. Uh, but by the time the Discover 39 was launched, it was actually quite successful and it, it really achieved everything it, it was set out to do. Uh, in other words, it took pictures and it returned the camera and, uh, sorry, not the camera, but the actual film from the camera. And uh, all of the film was developed quite, quite well. And of course, this gave US an idea for how to build these spy satellites. And as, as the time uh, went on, it was able to produce better and better satellites. And even today, some of these satellites are basically based on this particular program. But another interesting thing about this program is um, that uh, the actual satellite had a multi-stage recovery system as well. So here, the satellite, especially Discoverer 13 satellite, was essentially launched with a close to polar orbit, which was actually the first time that the polar orbit was achieved. It would then orbit the Earth for a few orbits, specifically uh, for Discover 13, it was 17 orbits. And then it would fire retrograde engines, uh, slow down enough so that it, would, it could actually re-enter the atmosphere. And during the re-entry, it would use a heat shield, which was actually the first time this was this kind of a um, uh, this device was actually used. It would use the heat shield to slow down, then uh, release the heat shield. In the last stages of the descent, it would then um, release the parachutes at about 15,000 meters. Uh, this would. Uh, activate the radio beacon and strobe lights, which would basically uh, tell the U United States Army where the satellite was about to land. Uh, the heat shield was then, was then released. And finally, the stabilization would be achieved by releasing a larger parachute that would then uh, cause the capsule to slowly descend back to Earth and either land on a surface uh, somewhere nearby or possibly in the water. But of course, the main success of these missions was the Thor rocket itself. It proved that it was a very successful way of launching different satellites into space and that it was a very stable, very, very efficient way of launching things. 
and it actually served the United States for many, many years, uh, including uh, the further missions that used Thor Delta staging that uh, actually became a very, very successful as well. And the derivative of Thor rocket is still in service today. As a matter of fact, the Delta rockets that we know today are sort of based on the earlier Thor designs. It just they've been uh, improved and redeveloped to the point where they are now a lot more efficient than they used to be. And the way these Thor rockets would function is uh, they would have a lower liquid uh, fuel stage with uh, obviously with oxidizer inside of it uh, with a few uh, stabilizers on the bottom and uh, two uh, uh, engines, vernier engines to try to control the ascent and one main engine on the bottom to basically provide the thrust. And so this design was so successful that it then spawned the Delta rockets which became the main launch platform for the United States for quite a few years. But even the earlier Thor rockets were used quite successfully to launch many satellites into space. Although nevertheless, the comparison between the Thor rocket and the R-7 rocket used in the Soviet Union, I would have to say that the Soviet Union rockets were much more superior, both in stability, in design, and in survivability, because a lot of Thor rockets ended up crashing earlier on and they did cause a lot of destruction uh, like i mentioned before only 13th discovery mission was actually able to reach the orbit but anyway it's also important to mention that both soviet union and the united states seem to have different uh, priorities for their missions the soviets were basically launching a lot of uh, life a lot of animals and a lot of uh, interesting experiments into space while the United States seemed to have focused on things like spying and uh, military advancement. So earlier on at least uh, it was quite obvious that the US was trying to develop new technologies to spy on their neighbors, spy on their enemies and uh, deliver their nuclear payload to countries far far away while Soviet Union was actually really trying to establish some sort of a scientific and possibly cultural superiority because they wanted to show the world that uh, despite being communist they were quite able to achieve a lot of technological uh, superiority to, to the United States by launching all of these uh, really awesome early satellites and early spaceships that would eventually uh, deliver the first uh, man to space as well. Anyway, so this was the nutshell of this mission. Even though it wasn't particularly that useful in terms of the advancement of the space program, it was a, quite an interesting mission because obviously it helped US to develop its first sa um, spy satellites, but it also helped us learn more about how electronic equipment behaves in space. Specifically, uh, certain cameras that uh, were launched to space actually had a lot of electrical interference that had to be solved. And the United States learned from these earlier satellites that it needed to try to ground certain uh, parts of its satellite in order for it not to produce electricity because otherwise it would actually cause quite a lot of static buildup that would possibly even cause explosions on satellites. But just like the US, I seem to have failed to uh, retrieve my satellite by basically crashing it back on Kremlin because my, uh, my parachutes were destroyed and did not deploy, unfortunately. Luckily, this capsule crashed safely on the planet and is now somewhere on Kerbin. And just like the original Discoverer mission that crashed somewhere where we're somewhere in Norway where we don't actually know where it is, we still haven't recovered even today. Uh, just like that mission back back in the days, uh, this satellite right here also crashed back on Carbon and is now irretrievable. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this little lesson on the first spy satellite and the Discover mission and Corona satellites that were launched by the United States and by CIA. Thank you so much for watching and if you enjoy Kerbal Space Program videos or space videos in general, please subscribe, like this video and share it with your friends and your family. Show it to your mom. Yes, that's right. Go and show it to your mom. Anyway, thank you guys for watching and give me later. Bye bye.